Hello and welcome to The Lair. After 115 hours, I finally finished Elden Ring and I thought I'd share my opinion. Chances are I'm going to regret it, but can I help myself? Nope. A quick note that if you're not comfortable when people criticize things you love and things you consider impeccable, you might want to skip this video. I'll see you later in the next one. Everything I'm going to say in this video is my personal opinion and my personal opinion only. I just share my experiences that I accumulated during over 100 hours I spent in this game. As fates would have it, Elden Ring is my first ever Dark Souls game that I completed. It wasn't easy and I wasn't sure that I would actually make it till the end, but I did. I did almost all major quest lines, defeated all shard bearers, and I think almost all optional bosses too. I opened the entire map, visited, I'd say most dungeons, and chose Rani's ending. I wanted to have a dex build, but on launch the game was losing frames, skipping inputs, delaying inputs, and I decided that I didn't really want to overcome all of that, in addition to already challenging gameplay, so I picked Astrologer and played the whole thing as a mage. But before we dive in, spoiler alert, I will be talking about all kinds of things, both story and gameplay and endings and all kinds of things, so if you haven't yet finished the game and don't want to be spoiled, turn back now. But, you know, come back when you're done. I've been keeping notes throughout my whole experience, so let's see what points I wrote down as the most important. We'll start with things that I didn't like and then move on to the things that I did enjoy. Of course, the main feature of Elden Ring that sets it apart from previous From Software games is open world. Open world is kind of a tricky concept. People usually think that having open world in your game is great by definition, when in fact having open world without good exploration incentives and good rewards is completely meaningless. Basically, there is only one question. Is the player satisfied with the reward they got for their exploration efforts? If yes, then it's a good open world that works. If the rewards are garbage, or even worse, irrelevant to the player and their experience, then they would just stick to the main quest, ride the main road, and stop bothering with exploration altogether. What kind of rewards are there? Depends on the game. Even cool vista spots can act as a reward. Many titles reward you with stories. Wherever you go, there are quests, new NPCs, new factions and their quest lines, stories upon stories upon stories. It can be fatiguing, but in general, if you're a story-oriented player, this type of reward for exploration either never gets boring or gets boring closer to the end of the game. Or you can encourage players to explore by offering them unique resources that they cannot get anywhere else. They cannot buy them, they cannot loot them from enemies, they need to explore to get them. For example, in Breath of the Wild, your exploration can reward you with either a shrine, a source of rare consumables that you cannot get anywhere else, or a Korok puzzle that will also give you a resource that you cannot get anywhere else. By tying exploration to unique resources that you cannot get by just punching bokoblins all day, Breath of the Wild is tempting to explore from start to finish, it doesn't matter what level you are or how much of the main questline you've completed. The rewards are always relevant, or at least fun because of the puzzle element, if you're into that sort of thing. A reward for exploration can literally be anything that reinforces the game's strongest aspects. They only need to be relevant to the player's experience to work. I think classic Souls formula that was left untouched in Elden Ring pairs quite poorly with the notion of open world. Your main resource is your runes. It's your currency and your XP points for leveling up. You get the most runes while following the main quests or bigger quest lines and killing bosses. Every other source of runes becomes irrelevant very quickly unless you want to farm somewhere for a couple of hours. Dungeons become irrelevant very quickly because they do not award any significant number of runes any longer, but take a lot of time and effort to get through. In my experience, dungeons, caves, mines, and other sub-areas lost their importance as soon as they hit level 50 or something along those lines. Sure, at the start, each felt like an incredible adventure, a new area to explore, but after dozens of hours I grew quite tired of them. They are very similar to one another, and it takes a lot of time and patience to get through a dungeon, because there are respawning skeletons, imps that cling to walls, zombies, traps, rot, poison, all kinds of annoying stuff, and when I finally get to the boss, it's a boss that I fought a number of times before, and after defeating him I get some mediocre ashes, if that, and like 6,000 runes when my level up costs 40, and I probably lost twice as much while getting to the boss room. Personally, I didn't find the rewards for exploration to be satisfying. Sure, sometimes exploration rewards you with good loot, unless you're a mage and there are literally four decent staffs in the game for you, 
crafting materials as rewards was a bizarre concept to me. If you're using a bow, you're probably in the market for crafting materials because you need arrows, otherwise the only things you're going to craft will be occasional boluses against poison or rods, and that's all. So the exploration incentive, but what if you find crafting materials, also doesn't really work. Some of these rewards didn't make any sense to me. You don't need to fight a dozen of demi-humans in Lyurnia to get a single mushroom on a corpse there for some reason guarding. You can just ride through a limb grave and stuff your pockets full of mushrooms. A mushroom is not a reward. I cannot express how much frustration I felt when I went to great lengths to get to purple loot, and then it turned out to be a smoldering butterfly or a nascent butterfly, both of which I can safely get elsewhere if I ever need to. Definitely let me know in the comments to what extent you personally used crafting materials in your playthrough, because I only crafted boluses for curing status ailments, and I also crafted oil once to get Alexander out of the ground. And that was it. Whatever relevant changes I could make through crafting were all in the Wondrous Physique flask, and the majority of crystal tiers is near minor earth trees that are marked on the map, so I didn't have to explore that much to get them. I think I stopped exploring every corner after I reached Landell. I got really tired of constant frustration as rewards were never proportionate to the amount of effort. At that point, I already made my peace with the fact that the gear I had would be the gear I finished the game with, and the only thing left for me to pursue was runes for leveling up. After I lost 40,000 in a dungeon and the boss rewarded me with exactly 7,000, I decided that it was just pointless. I moved on along the main quest because I would be much happier fighting Millennia for her runes and her remembrance than spending an hour trying to get through some dungeon riddled with traps and imps and chariots to reach a boss who'll give me basically nothing. However, it would be unfair on my part not to acknowledge that for many people, especially for those already familiar with Soulsborne and for those who really enjoy this type of gameplay, the challenge itself might very well be the reward. I know that many people don't really care how many runes the dungeon boss rewards you with, they don't find it especially frustrating to die repeatedly and lose runes, but instead derive enjoyment from the process of overcoming a challenge. And that's awesome. We're all different and we like different things in games as well as in general. I like a good and fair challenge, but I struggle to view Elden Ring's exploration as such. That is why the open world in this game kinda worked for me, but also kinda didn't really. I've never had such an experience in an open world video game, but some parts of Elden Ring seemed completely random to me, especially enemy placement. I know that open world is hard to fill with diverse enemies and bosses, but that's not my point. I distinctly remember rising through mountaintops of the giants to the fire giant boss fight, seeing the most random assortment of enemies around. Spider hands, otherwise absent from this specific area, dogs and giant ravens that I hadn't seen at all while exploring the rest of the mountaintops. It felt like there were no ideas what to fill this part of the map with, so it was filled with whatever. T-Rex dogs and giant ravens are omnipresent and just reskinned, there is your scarlet rock dogs and ravens, your bloody dogs and ravens, and now apparently frostbite-inducing dogs and ravens, spider hands that I thought were specific to carry a manor and mage-themed location in general, showed up in the capital sewers, and I thought, okay, apparently they're not magic-related, they live in the sewers too, and I was fine with it. Why did they show up on the mountaintops and in this specific area just before the fire giant? Now, I completely understand that you cannot just fill the giant open world with completely unique enemies and they're bound to repeat. I'm fine with that, there is nothing wrong with that. It's just that the coherence in some areas was completely lost on me. I arrived at mountaintops of the giants and met Zamor warriors in Zamor ruins. Those guys were new and they were tough. And I was like, woof, these guys obviously inhabit this area, so the journey will be quite difficult. And then I never saw them ever again. It was just so bizarre to me. Of all the enemies, I expected them to fight giants near the fire giant arena because that's kind of their lore. The same goes for bosses that become common enemies and common enemies that sometimes become bosses. Leonine Misbegotten is either a boss or just a regular enemy. Crucible Knight is either a boss or a regular enemy. Dungeons have a rotation of bosses and, while I'm not saying make every dungeon have a unique boss, probably it might have been a good idea to make fewer dungeons so one wouldn't have to fight the Earth Tree Watchdogs five times with such variations as and now there are two of them, 
or now they are smaller and just inhabit the dungeon like regular enemies. The double boss fight with the Crucible Knight and the Leonine Misbegotten at Redmain Castle puzzles me to this day. Why are they there? Why were they paired up? Literally the weirdest pairing in the game. I don't even think you ever encounter them in the same area. It felt like there wasn't any plan for Redmain Castle apart from the festival, so they decided to throw in a random boss fight with two most random enemies promoted to bosses. Oh yeah, and Godskins. I call them placeholder bosses. These guys are the most random enemies that show up whenever a boss fight is necessary in the game. Their lore is pretty awesome. Their Glomite Queen was an Empyrean chosen by the Two Fingers. The Apostles served destined death and wielded Godslaying Black Flame until they were defeated by Malakath and lost their power. And Godskin Nobles are the most ancient Apostles. I thought they were significant enough to be placed somewhere specifically, but instead, they're all over the place. One noble is on the bridge leading to the Divine Tower of Lyurnia, another one is in Volcano Manor for some reason, one Apostle is in the Windmill Village of all places, and also at the basement of the Divine Tower of Kaelid. I would have assumed they just guard Divine Towers, but that was not the case because all the other towers didn't have any Godskins guarding them. And then there is not one but two double boss fights with both Noble and Apostle, one of them in a dungeon and another one, again, of all places, in Faramazula, in the walking distance from Malakath, who is supposed to be their grave enemy. The main quest also suffers from losing the direction and becoming somewhat random after Malana ignites the earth tree. I got teleported to Faramazula with zero sense of purpose. What am I supposed to do here? Why did I warp? I went back to see if the state of the world changed, and it didn't. I asked around, and nobody was concerned with the burning earth tree that much, and no one was moving anywhere. So I had to follow the video game logic and just scout Faramazula with no sense of purpose or direction. When I reached Malakath and defeated him, completely unsure why I had to do that and what we were fighting for, he was like, To kill what? And I almost screamed, I don't know, Malakath. I don't even know why I'm here and why I had to fight you. I have no clue. I hope I managed to convey my point. The lack of consistency and coherence bothered me more than anything else. I was constantly asking myself, why is this here? Again, I want to emphasize that my problem is not that there aren't enough unique enemies, Elden Ring has plenty of them, it's that their placement was often unexpected to me in a way that seemed random and broke immersion. I'm a story-driven player, I can put up with all kinds of flaws if the lore and the story are interesting enough, and in Elden Ring this is totally the case. However, it's an absolute nightmare to follow some bigger quest lines because NPCs migrate into most unexpected places and have a bunch of obscure prerequisites for you to fulfill before they give you any info. The usual Soulsborne formula for side quests also pairs quite poorly with the notion of open world because now you have no clue where your NPC went and what triggers them to progress along their story. Sometimes they tell you, most of the time they don't. Some of them kind of move along your main quest, and that would be a good thing, but the problem is that you might not trigger them to move at the same time that you move, and you would be out of sync. Rani's questline is probably the easiest to follow because it is constructed very much like a traditional questline in an ordinary open-world RPG game. You have your hub location, three sisters, and two NPCs there that never change places, Rani and Salivus. You also have EG, and he never changes place. You always know where to find them to get an update or some sense of direction. Blythe is the only character from this quest line that moves around, but he always tells you where he's going to. The fact that half the time he doesn't actually show up there is another matter. Rani and Eiji serve as narrators and Blythe leads you forward up to a certain point. Since you are not running around in the open world for the most part of this quest, but instead explore a much more linear underground, it's much easier to progress, follow the narrative, and at the same time feel like there is a coherent story that you're actually a part of. Ironic that the only quest line I found solid was the one that was, one, more like an ordinary RPG quest line, and two, much more linear than any other. Millicent's quest line is also easier to follow compared to the rest because she spawns near Sides of Grace, so you have a higher chance to follow her along. It was also kind of immersion-breaking for me to go and talk to every single NPC after I did something major, accessed a new location or defeated a shard bearer, in case it would trigger them to move somewhere or give me a quest. 
I thought, well, I just did that. Might be a trigger for someone and then went around talking to people because I didn't want to miss any quests. Of course, I missed some. For example, I never discovered why Rogier turned into a root dumpling and died on the balcony after sitting there for like 30 hours. Turned out I didn't touch the bloodstain somewhere below Stormvale Castle. You might say that I should have explored better, but you know, I was there. I killed the tree spirit and all, but then I immediately turned left and looked at Godwin's creepy face from there, and the bloodstain was somewhere to the right, I just didn't notice it. Thea's quest was hard to progress because for me it was buggy and I had to rest at the grace like three or four times before it triggered Thea's new dialogue. With brother Corin, I was completely out of sync. He left the round table hold and just disappeared. I couldn't find him anywhere, even though he told me that he was going to meet Gold Mask. But he wasn't there for some reason. I eventually found him on Altus Plateau after I completed the mountaintops, and I had to follow the wiki to progress his questline because he teleported to the places I already fully explored and had no reason to return to. I was really disappointed that the questline progression was not really adapted to the notion of open world. NPCs talk like fortune cookies and just zip zap around, and when you find them, they tell you dot 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 because you didn't fulfill some unknown condition for their quest to move on. I'm still frustrated about Raya's questline, it was the one that interested me a great deal. I found her in Lyurnia, got the invitation, joined the Volcano Manor, and she was there. And then she just vanished. I thought she'd probably return once I finished the questline, but nope. I found her quest item and I had to google what it is for because nobody wanted it. Apparently I didn't talk to her in some obscure time and she just disappeared from the face of the lands between. I feel like skipping quests or butchering their progression was my fault, in the sense that sometimes the game just sucked me in and I forgot to go and talk to every single NPC after every big sneeze. Well, sorry for enjoying some parts of the game so much that I forgot to run a is it a trigger for your quest survey, I guess. Playing Elden Ring is sometimes really annoying. Target lock-on is bad. Countless times I tried to lock onto an enemy standing in front of me and the game would just turn me 180. I fiddled with settings but saw no substantial improvement, it's just how it works. The game also eats some inputs, so when I want to unlock and run away just won't unlock. Dismounting torrents sometimes just doesn't work. Platforming in Elden Ring very often goes sideways because torrents hooves are smothered in butter and he slides after landing. Platforming on roots is frustrating because roots are kind of round and torrent sometimes just does not adhere to their textures properly and slides right off. I remember falling off a cliff and when I came back from my runes I discovered that apparently while falling I touched some stray texture and the game counted it as my last place of standing and spawned my runes there, on a vertical cliff. There is also fall damage that isn't random but absolutely feels this way. Some enemies have insane range that just feels unfair. Mage enemies certainly do. I was a mage myself, I had the same spells, I knew exactly what their range was, and it certainly wasn't a mile the last time I checked. The ancestral followers sniped me with their arrows the size of a rail from like three hills away and I couldn't figure out where they even were. And yeah, everything clips through everything. Some textures are solid, others are solid from one side, the others are solid only for you. If a boss is big, you just clip through him and it breaks your camera. Ulcerated tree spirit near Volcano Manor slides through all wooden spikes and bonfires while you get stuck in them. Better not hide behind corners, because enemy swords just go right through and magic splash damage does too. Sometimes a boss fight rewarded me with zero sense of achievement because the boss would just get stuck in something, clip through a wall, or despawn and then respawn losing his aggro and allowing me free hits. Field bosses in general didn't feel really rewarding to me in terms of being proud of myself or feeling accomplished, and now I had to pray every single time that the boss won't bug or get stuck somewhere and can put up a fight. And there were also technical issues that I think many people experienced, no matter the specs. Balance in this game is absolutely out of whack. I was constantly either underleveled or overleveled, and I can't remember any area that would be level appropriate for me when I explored it. I found myself constantly trying to fix the game balance myself to either add challenge or turn it down a notch. Choices that you make out of curiosity because you want to try something new most likely would directly influence how easy or hard the game would be and to a great degree. Playing without Ash summons can be challenging, sometimes overly so, and yet when you summon someone it just trivializes the encounter. 
This was extremely frustrating for me because I wanted to explore more ashes and try more summons while still feeling, you know, a fair challenge, but it was almost never achievable. And I'm not talking about cheesing or exploits, it's just how the game is balanced. While exploring, I encountered enemies in the exact same area that looked absolutely identical, but some of them required two hits and others required six hits. They were basically next to each other. Adula took me a few tries, but it was fine and he was a boss. Not far away from him, there is a lesser Red Wolf of Radigan, who is just an enemy, and that thing is basically mortal, takes no damage from anything I have. I was always on one of the extremes, either I just melt everything around me, or I cannot do any damage, and then I go and explore and level up a bit, and then I come back and melt everything around me. It felt especially challenging playing as a mage, because I felt like I had to constantly shoot myself in the foot to fix the game balance and make it at least somewhat interesting to play, I know that playing as a mage for some reason is often frowned upon in the community, and I never understood why. I played as a mage because I wanted to cast pretty spells, not because I wanted to breeze through the game. People say that magic is OP. Why though? Why does it have to be? I was hoping with all my heart that the game would encourage me to experiment, to change my spells, to change my staff and my gear in general, to adapt, but it never happened. I finished the game with about the same tools I started with because they were still effective. Renala, who's supposed to have high magic resistance, does have it for everything but the rock sling that will demolish her in 4-5 to five casts. Many gravitational spells say something about Radan since he's the big boss using such magic, and I expected that he would have some sort of resistance to it. I was hoping I would have to be creative to defeat him, that I'd have to employ my wits, Yet Radan gets destroyed by Roxling just like everyone else I encountered in the last 50 hours. Makes you wondrous physique to have Cerulean hidden tear that prevents FP loss for 15 seconds and get ready to pulverize any big enemy that stands in one place for more than a second with Comet Azure. I annihilated Morgoth in one cast. I hoped I wouldn't be able to, but it worked. Had to go on YouTube to see what his second face is like and if he says anything important. Luckily, his twin brother Mog didn't allow me to do that, but I still did 14k damage to him with a single cast of Comet Azure. At some point, I felt it was borderline rude not to have any proper weapon to occasionally swing around. I used Wing of Astel because it's pretty, and uh, Darkmoon Greatsword because Ronnie gave it to me. Why would you use Comet Azure if it's OP, you'll ask? You shouldn't use Rock Sling if it's too powerful. It's not my job to balance this stuff. Why should I constantly be like, oh my god, I'm too powerful, I need to change spells to less effective ones if I want some challenge? This is ridiculous, and it shouldn't be the case. I should be concerned with constantly moderating difficulty for myself, trying to keep it from falling either into insurmountable or non-existent. I'm not using exploits, I'm not cheesing, these are the strategies the game lets you choose, and their balance is questionable, to put it mildly. I remember thinking, I've got to change my meteorite staff because I'm sick of it, it's been my staff for 60 hours, it's still very effective and it probably will be till the end of the game. I changed my gear not because I progressed enough to find something more powerful, but because I got sick of it and just wanted new stuff. That was a sad open world RPG experience. And now, when you've probably lost all hope for positivity, let me tell you what I actually liked about Elden Ring. I told you there was something, otherwise I wouldn't have spent 115 hours in it, would I? I remember thinking, even if the rest of Elden Ring is bad, I won't be able to hate this game because Rani's quest was so awesome. You know, I just want the video game to have characters that I can care for and sympathize with, and Rani's quest provided me with just that. I immensely enjoyed exploring Nokron and Nextella, they were more linear and thus more coherent, if it makes sense. Beautiful also. I wanted to help Rani, but at the same time I wasn't really sure that I could trust her because of her stealing the Rune of Death and being the catalyst for the main plot. I really liked the company of E.G. and Blythe, even though Blythe hardly ever showed up where he promised to. Rani's quest was one of the few times I was in the zone while playing Elden Ring. I just couldn't stop. The fight with Astel was absolutely incredible visually, especially because you have a chance to find Wing of Astel beforehand. I was wondering what kind of creature it was, and then I entered the arena and was like, oh, you're Astel, you're so pretty, what's with your face, though? Too bad they reused this fight in some random dungeon. 
I think that the moment when you find Rani under the Cathedral of Manasellas, sitting in front of the mole two fingers, is among the most powerful in the entire game. I was heartbroken over both Blythe and Ichi, and over Inala too. And that's what I want from a FromSoft game. I want to care about the characters, I want to be invested. They explored more of tight-knit questlines in Sekiro, where all the NPCs were in some way connected, and the story was transparent enough for you to understand what was going on, and for you to be able to care, and in Elden Ring I found some more of that. Rani's ending, The Age of Stars, also has probably the most beautiful cutscene in the entire game, gives me goosebumps every time. Unfortunately, the ending was mistranslated from Japanese to the point of being the opposite of what was intended in the original. I knew that some ending was lost in translation, and unfortunately it was Rani's. I have a video on it, so if you're unsure what I'm talking about, you can check it out. It is sad that it was mistranslated, but I'm glad the knowledge about it is spreading inside the community, because many people who pursued Rani's ending ended up very confused. While we're on the topic of NPCs that I cared about, I think the dearest dear of the game is undoubtedly Roderica. She's the sweetest soul to ever grace a FromSoft game. I love that you're able to see her journey from a heartbroken girl who never saw grace to a master of spirit tuning. I wanted to support her with everything I had to give her the strength to pursue her true calling, and I was running back and forth between her and Master Hugh, whom I also love, to persuade her that she wasn't useless at all and that she could really make a difference. Another NPC that always had a place in my thoughts was the last queen of Caria, Renal of the Full Moon. Her story is incredibly tragic. The man she loved left her, her daughter defied fate and killed her body, her son Rikard gave himself to the Great Serpent, and her another son Rodan lost his mind. Not to mention that apparently she had more daughters that also perished. The Academy ousted her and confined her in the Great Library. And yet she's the embodiment of a sweet and loving mother, and she's ready to help you respect any time you want. I thought she was a shadow of her former self, sitting there in the library half-conscious, clutching the amber egg, and then I completed Salon's quest. I chose to fight against Salon because I didn't want her to hurt Renala, but that wasn't necessary at all. Even if you choose to side with her and she brags about overthrowing the Queen of Caria, the next time you rest, Renala is back in the room where she usually sits, and Selen is a ball of sad stone faces in the corner. And Renala continues cradling the ember egg and speaking in a really soft and loving voice. That was the moment I realized that Renala is still a powerful sorceress and she is to be feared. Warrior jars are an incredible concept that is both super cool and really disturbing. I like how you meet Alexander and he's such a great fellow and a proud warrior, and then he eats Radan's corpse and you're like, what? I saw many people on streams and elsewhere who tried to comfort him after the fight with Radan, when he's crestfallen over his cowardice, and it was so sweet. Everybody was like, no, Alexander, you fought so well, you tanked all the damage, you're a great warrior. Ah, oh, it was really heartwarming. I also tried to comfort him in my playthrough. <laughs> Unfortunately, I couldn't complete the Jarberg questline because I saw Dialos once in the round table hold and then never again. I think it has something to do with this quest being patched in later on, and something probably just broke in my playthrough. However, I had great fun trying to yank Alexander out of the ground the second time when you need to cover him with oil, and I didn't have the recipe for it, so I went on searching. I think that when he explodes after the duel and covers you in blood, there was also a powerful and quite shocking moment. I was definitely heartbroken yet again. Unfortunately, I didn't find boss fights to be mechanically enjoyable at all, but there were a few I liked for other reasons. For example, I think Mog Lord of Blood has the coolest cutscene lore-wise, uh, when everything is covered in blood and there is Mikkel in the cocoon, and Mog is incredibly creepy. I think many bosses look amazing. I like Phase 2 Malekath the most, when he sheds the cloak and there is his black and gold armor and you realize he's a wolf. I was like, wait a second, are you someone's shadowbound? Are you Marika's shadowbound? I know that Millennia's fight is a hot topic for discussion. I think she would have made a great Sekiro boss. It was fun to learn how to dodge her waterfowl slash. Uh, when I saw it for the first time, I thought, well, this is how Tomoe would fight, isn't it? 
Melania was the only boss that pushed me to experiment and try new things because she's very agile and most of my usual spells just couldn't hit her, so I used Rani's Dark Moon and Comet and Stars of Ruin. It was fun. Phase 2 wasn't as fun to me because it was too beautiful and it was hard to see what was going on. That was my problem with a lot of boss fights, because of all the pretty colors and shimmering and glimmering and particles, it's often hard to see what's going on. Millennia Phase 2 is like that because of all the butterflies, Rikard Phase 2 is just whatever, it's impossible to understand what's happening, there is lava and red skulls, and everything explodes and it's just a visual mess. I fought Mog Lord of Blood before Millennia, and for some reason I was sure that I could just tell her that I found her brother and then I won't have to fight her. Seemed pretty logical to me, she wants to find Mikola and I know where he is, why not give me a choice to tell her? Godfrey encounter was epic, and it would have been much more epic if I hadn't fought his spirit version before. That seemed completely out of place. The dude isn't even dead. I also love the incredible Marika Radigan design, how they morph into one another very gradually. You can actually see it in the E3 uh, trailer that we got a few years ago, but since we didn't know what it was about, I think many people just didn't notice it. I sure didn't. I was somewhat disappointed that they didn't really utilize their duality apart from the boss fight cutscene. I expected the first phase to be against Radigan and the second phase to be against Marika, and that they would have like different movesets and different spells and whatnot, and you would need to show off your flexibility and adapt, but alas. I think story-wise the Marika-Radigan concept worked really well, and better yet that you have a chance to learn about it if you pursue the Statue of Radigan quest. However, I must say that the funniest boss encounter that I had was with uh, Sir Gideon Ofnir, the All-Knowing. I knew at some point we'd have to fight, and I loved it. He just spams every type of magic there is. Comet Azure, Black Flame, Law of Causality, Blood Boon. Later I learned that apparently he casts certain spells like Blood Boon and Scarlet Ionia only if you tell him about your encounters with Mogan Millennia, which I did, and I don't regret it because him casting Scarlet Ionia just cracked me up. It was hilarious. When Millennia casts it, it is majestic. A tall goddess with rotten wings of butterflies manifests a scarlet lotus flower in the air. Fantastic. And here is Gideon, a man of medium height in his silver armor that jumps into the air and manifests a giant flower being completely dwarfed by it. I laughed so hard, I think I woke up my neighbors. I also loved how some enemies were designed, for example, Black Knife Assassins. They're supposed to be formidable, and they are. I dreaded every encounter. They're very quick, deadly, and can cover incredible distances, so running away isn't really an option. They do the same 90 degrees hovering step that Millennia does, so it's really hard to catch them and actually do damage, at least it was for me. Zammer Warriors also have a really cool design. It was unfortunate I saw so little of them. Spider hands, despite being really annoying, were a great invention, especially big ones that catch you like a trap when you step on them trying to loot something. Marionettes were hilarious, especially the four-handed ones that just swing around frantically or fire two bows simultaneously. I also like how the small marionettes malfunction once you deal enough damage to them and start behaving as if they're horribly bugged. When I first saw a video of it on Twitter, I was convinced it was a bug. Turns out it's how these enemies are by design. The scariest enemy in the game for me was Malformed Star. When I saw it for the first time, I was ready to literally alt a 4 because it looked like it was about to devour the whole game from within. It can be killed fairly easily and it quickly staggers, but oh my god, does it provide the purest nightmare fuel. Elden Ring looks great. There is a lot of terrain variety, all kinds of poisonous swamps, a whole lake of rot even. There are red wastelands of Kaelid, silver and blue Lyurnia, golden Altus Plateau, black and ivory Faramazula. I love that they introduced time of day, that was a great decision. Honestly, after I gave up on my dex build, I decided to play a mage because I saw how beautiful the spells were in the game. I was like, I want to be able to do that. All spells and their effects just look stunning, like both Renala's and Rani's moons, Comet Azure, Glintstone magic, all of them. My absolute favorite, however, is the weapon skill of the Wing of Astel, Nebula. Oh my god, it looks breathtaking. Astel casts it, obviously, and Elden Beast does too, and I would often just look at it instead of running away from it. Crafting materials and items in general are also drawn so beautifully, I would just stare at the pictures for minutes on end trying to soak up the colors. 
I like that Elden Ring has a lot of light, which wasn't the case for previous FromSoft titles. However, the dungeons are really, really dark, so you need to use either a lantern or a torch to light your way. I appreciated the contrast. I wasn't able to utilize Ashes of War all that much, but I love the concept. It allows you to diversify your playstyle and try a bunch of new things. It also allows for the most fun and wild challenges, like can I beat Millennia with only this weapon art? Adds insane variety. I was really excited about Spirit Ashes, partly because Elden Ring, much like the previous Dark Souls games I tried, was quite scary for me to play at times, and I was happy I often had an option to summon someone to be by my side as I traverse a particularly scary area. Their balance is something that requires more attention, in my opinion, however, the concept is really good. The most precious part about Spirit Ashes is that some of them have real-world interactions, and this is honestly one of my favorite parts of the whole game, and I wish there was more of that. On the mountaintops, you can find a spirit jellyfish, who is a sister of the spirit jellyfish that Rodrika gives you at the start of the game, and you can summon her, her name is Aurelia, and watch their interaction. A Latenna can mount hostile direwolves if they happen to come near her, and then she becomes a mounted archer, and I think she gains an additional ability or something. Thanked imps can help you solve a puzzle in one of the rice towers, if there was more of that in the game, if every spirit summon had a real-world interaction, however small, I would scout every single dungeon in hopes that some spirit ash will drop from the fifth Tree watchdog boss, and I would be able to summon that ash somewhere and it would have an effect. I personally used Banish Knight Oleg most of the time and switched to Black Knife Tish in the endgame. I believe Tish is the only viable spirit Ash for Millennia fight, because she moves around a lot and it's hard for Millennia to catch her and heal off of her. She also does pretty good damage. Mimic Tear, although an interesting concept, wasn't really all that useful to me. I imagine it being handy for other builds. Early game exploration was really fun. Whipping Peninsula was kind of weird, there weren't a lot of interesting places, but Limgrave was a sweet first area for such a big open world game. Leorne of the Lakes is definitely my most favorite area. It's really tight, there is a lot of story-relevant places like Albinoric Village, Moonlight Altar, Caria Manor, Three Sisters, and of course the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. Probably my favorite sub-area in the whole game because it was not architecturally suffocating to explore like Lendal or Halic Tree. It's on the smaller and sweeter side where you can actually get your bearings and have a sense of direction. I find Lyurnia as a whole to be beautiful and rewarding when it comes to exploration. There aren't as many open spaces as some other major areas have. It's packed with all sorts of different terrain and hard-to-reach places. It's not as tedious to explore as Kaelid's wastelands, and there you actually have some downtime to take in the views and the atmosphere, without enemies constantly ripping your guts out. Kaelid was something that I could only assess in comparison, because the first time I got there I was like, oh no. This must be the worst area in the whole game. And then I experienced the likes of Subterranean Shunning Grounds and Lanedale and Halic Tree, and then I was like, you know, Kaelid was pretty cool. I think I'll take my whole family there on our next vacation. Voice actors in Elden Ring were just top-notch. It was incredibly refreshing to hear such accent variety really warmed my heart. My favorites were Amy Theon Edwards, who voiced Rani, Anthony Howell, the voice of Morgoth and Margit, of course. Pippa Bennett Warner, who voiced Millennia. I wish she had more lines. Helen Monks, the voice of Roderica. Scott Arthur, who voiced Blythe. Simon Gregor did an amazing job voicing Reichardt. That performance was disturbing in the way that really suited the character. And, of course, Joe McGunn, who voiced Sir Gideon of Near the All-Knowing. Sorry if I butchered any names, I didn't mean to. I thought it would be fun to share some of my favorite lines from the game. Foolish Ambitions is kind of a meme at this point, I know. Here is my most favorite one. Foul trespasser. Send word far and wide. Of the last queen of Caria. Renala of the full moon. And the majesty of the night she conjureth. And this one is a close second. Have it writ upon thy meager grave. Felt by king. 
King Morgoth. Last of all kings. Let me know in the comments which line from the game turned out to be most memorable for you. I am Melania, Blade of... FromSoft has a very passionate community. I see a great number of people creating incredible art, posting the most hilarious memes and their funny PvP encounters, supporting new players who never played any FromSoft game before, and just a lot of people having a blast with Elden Ring. And that's awesome. However, some conversations around Elden Ring bring me more sadness than any flaw the game itself might have. I saw people saying that those who use spirit ashes or summons should get the worst ending because they are not playing the game right, that people who use magic are just playing on easy mode and cannot be considered a fan, that people who use katana swords cannot be considered proper players either because katana swords are OP, just a bunch of horrible stuff that left me at a loss. If someone dislikes Elden Ring, it means they didn't understand it. But there is nothing to understand. It's a video game. It's either fun for you and you're having a good time with it, or it's not fun and you're not having a good time, and that's all. And that's fine. I'm a firm believer that the only correct way to play a game is to have fun with it. And, you know, let other people have fun with it too. If you're having fun, you're playing the game right. It doesn't matter if you use Spirit Ashes or not, if you're using Spells or Moon Veil or Comet Azure or whatever. The only thing that matters is if you're having a good time or not. If someone likes to challenge themselves and wants to complete the game without Spirit Ashes, fast travel, no torch or torch only, they're welcome to do so. It's their experience and they're free to shape it however they want. I don't know where this attitude comes from. If you love the game, don't you want more people to enjoy it and give it attention? I also feel like nuanced conversations are banned most of the time. You're allowed to either love Elden Ring unconditionally and then people accept you, or you're a hater and people hate you. You cannot say things like, I love the game but this and that were the things that I didn't like, because then you're a hater. This is bizarre to me. I try to always be critical to the media I consume. I analyze things a lot to see how they compare to my previous experience. I love hearing what people have to say about the games I enjoy, both negative and positive things, because no one's opinion is going to change my own, you know? If someone tells me that they don't like Sekiro or Hollow Knight or Hades because of such and such reason, it won't change the fact that I love those games, not in the slightest. But it will give me a valuable perspective on how different things work for different people and how other players might not enjoy the things that I enjoy. These conversations are very productive, while the dichotomy either love it or hate it leads to stagnation. I wonder if this is a byproduct of sunk cost fallacy that is unavoidable when the subject of the matter is such a long anticipated release. So uh, here you have it, my super lengthy and, as I imagine, incredibly unpopular opinion. I hoped Elden Ring would be different the way Sekiro was different. Mind you, I didn't want it to be like Sekiro, I wanted it to be different how Sekiro was different from other Soulsborne titles. But Elden Ring is basically a big Dark Souls. There is nothing wrong with that. Many people wanted it to be a big Dark Souls. I just wasn't one of those people. Elden Ring had some really good parts and some really annoying parts. But I love that it was so multifaceted. It was fun analyzing my experience and putting it into words. Remember that it is just a personal opinion and not a personal insult to anyone. I could have said that I enjoyed the game and there wasn't a flaw I found, but that simply wouldn't be true. If you enjoyed Elden Ring wholeheartedly, that's awesome, and I'm sincerely happy that you were able to look past or enjoy the things that I took issue with. Games are meant to be played for fun, and if you had fun, that's awesome. Please let me know what your experience was with Elden Ring, whether you loved the game or didn't, if there were particular aspects of the game that you enjoyed the most or that ruined all the fun. Here in the lair, I favor nuanced opinions, so feel free to share your thoughts if you feel like it. Please be respectful in the comments. Will there be Elden Ring content? As of now, I'm really burnt out on Elden Ring, so there won't be any content anytime soon. I know that Elden Ring is burning hot right now and I could slap something together and get the views and the channel will grow. Nah. This content rush is really anxiety-inducing for me, and I don't think I would be proud of that content down the line, so it's not really worth it. When they release some sort of art book or design works, I'll try my best to get the Japanese edition, and then we'll see. I feel like if I ever start an Elden Ring project similar to the one I have on Sekiro, 
It will be just to catch mistranslations and not because I'm super interested in the lore itself, I'm pretty satisfied with my understanding of it. I think I might start a second playthrough sometime in the future, maybe a dex build that I wanted in the first place, but as of now I want to focus more on playing other games and continuing my Sekiro project that I aim to finish this year. This has been a really, really long video, and if you stuck around till the end, thank you very much for your time, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.